the following statement. The Maryland Open Meetings Act, a state law, requires public meetings to be open to the public and to be held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. General Provisions Article Section 3102C. The virtual format of this meeting of the County Council is due to the COVID-19 emergency and is necessary in light of the serious health risks associated with public gatherings, as well as the governor's various executive orders limiting public gatherings. While a virtual meeting of this type was not envisioned by the Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternate accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have reviewed and approved, such as having a call-in number that allows anyone with a telephone to call and listen to the meeting, broadcasting the meeting with video and audio on cable TV and on the web, and allowing written public comments to the legislation to be filed with the clerk and considered by the council. The County Office of Law has opined that the public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public and therefore complies with the Open Meetings Act. Thank you. Is there any item any council member would like to place on the agenda at this time? Seeing none, because this is a virtual meeting, we cannot provide reasonable seating facilities for the public or the news media, and we cannot physically be located in Annapolis, the county seat. May I have a motion to suspend rules 3-103 relating to the location of meetings, 3-105 relating to reasonable seating facilities for the public, and 3-106 relating to reasonable seating facilities for the news media? Councilwoman Advan, so moved. May I have a second? Councilman Pruski, second. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Please call the roll on this on this um, motion. Ms. Fiedler. Aye. Ms. Rodbian. Aye. Ms. Hare. Aye. Ms. Lacey. Aye. Mr. Pruski. Aye. Ms. Pickard. Aye. Six in the affirmative, one absent. The motion to suspend rules 3103, 3105, and 3106 is passed. Thank you. We will begin today's presentation with inspections and permits. All presenters, please remember to introduce yourself and continue to identify yourself before speaking each time. We'll begin with Mr. Greg Africa and Katie Barker. And the budget analyst present today is Ms. Darlene. We'll take a pause while they come into the meeting. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Africa. You have the floor, sir. Uh, good afternoon, members of, of the council. My name is Greg Africa, I'm Director of Inspections and Permits. Um, I'm here to present the um, 2021 proposed budget. And I'd like, like to have, have a, a brief introduction of um, what our department does. We have 144 employees that provide plan review and permit processing for development projects. We inspect all building, trades, grading, and infrastructure permits. For those activities that are unauthorized and unpermitted, we investigate all customer complaints and deal with, with those unauthorized and unpermitted development. We also issue commercial licenses we inspect private stormwater facilities. We manage the vegetative manage pl management plan of the county, including the forestation and reforestation activities. Our key objectives for next year is to implement the phase, the first phase of our land use navigator pro uh, pro program, which provides for more efficient permit application and approval processes and greater transparency. Had we had this uh, program uh, currently, it would have re really uh, applied itself in this current situation where we have social dis distancing and the county offices were closed. The second ma major um, key objective for next year is to update our, our uh, code articles for pertaining to updated licensing requirements in Article 11. We are updating our construction codes and code supplement for Article 15. 
bringing up the county from 2015 to 2018 standards as required by uh, state law. And we are going to update our grading permit requirements and private stormwater management warranty requirements, security war uh, requirements in Article 16. So although I have a no we have a number of key objectives mentioned in the budget book, I think these two are the most important ones that I'd like to up update, uh, to highlight today. Um, I would like to transfer the floor to Darlene Flynn to, to talk about the comparative statement of expenditures. members. My name is Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office, and I'd like to turn your attention to page, um, well, the Inspections and Permitting Budget, which starts on page 194, and I'll be going over the Comparative Statement of Expenditures, which starts on page 195. So, ready, we can get started. The uh, Department of Inspections and Permits has three separate funds which support their department. First, the general fund, which uh, is proposed at 14,041,700 for um, FY21, which is a $369,500 increase over FY20. The watershed protection and restoration fund is proposed at 1.3 or 1,348,500 or 62,200 above FY20. And then the ref reforestation fund, which is proposed at $810,600, which is a reduction of $2.9 million. If you look down further on the chart under the object category, in personal services, there's been an increase of a little over 500,000. And this is due to the um, countywide increases in pay package and benefits which is offset by, of course, the implementation of a hiring freeze. The next area of contractual services has a $2.7 million reduction. And this reduction is in the reforestation area or program, and that's keeping in line with revenues. Further down, there's a large reduction in capital outlay of 125,000, and that is for the one-time um, budget in FY20 for vehicles supporting new positions. The last object there, the grants, contributions, and others, has a reduction of 155,000. And again, that is keeping, um, that is a reduction in the reforestation program, keeping in line with revenues. Thank you. To um, highlight that due to the hiring freeze, this budget does not represent any increase in staffing. And uh, we will just basically hold the line in, in the number of employees we have at 144 employees. Um, I am opening the floor for questions from, from the council. Do I have any questions from my colleagues for Mr. Africa regarding Ms. Lacey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Africa, um, did the department request any positions from the uh, in your budget that you proposed to the county executive? Yes, we did request some positions, um, but, but again, like uh, countywide uh, strategy of the, uh, the administration is is to address the the deficit that uh, we're expecting. So none of them were approved. However. There were two um, requests for reclassifications that were approved. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, proposed by by the administration and approved by the administration for inclusion in the budget. Can you tell us what the new positions that you were going to request are, or is that something that we should get through, Madam Auditor? Uh, we can supply it through through the Madam Auditor. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pruski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Africa, great, great seeing you. Uh, thank you again. Uh, the budget sounds very reasonable. I do have a question though, in regards to hotel inspectors. Um, as you know, and particularly in my area, we have a lot of hotels that have continual issues. And 
what was mentioned by the administration prior was additional staffing. So I, I just wanted to check to see if we have uh, um, you know enough support and other things or using other inspectors to, to make sure we hold those folks accountable. Um, and, and I don't know if you want to just comment on it overall, but uh, I know at one point there was talk about adding people and I get it, you know, during the crisis and, and everything that the county executive is doing, but I want to also make sure that we're continuing those efforts um, to, um, you know, do our part. Thank you. Mr. Bruce Creed, most of the complaints uh, regarding hotels are in the area of, of health, health concerns. So basically we follow the lead of the health department. There are of the uh, complaints on hotels that are just very, very little building or, or property code maintenance violations, but it's mostly on the health violations. Thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, Mr. Africa, last year uh, we did in the budget, there were a number of new positions um, for INP. Have you filled those positions this year? Okay. You're muted, sir. Okay. Mr. Africa, you're, oh, there you go. <laughs> you were on mute. <laughs> you're okay now. Um, Greg Africa, I, I believe but I can go back to the records. I think they were hired uh, as early as January of this year. So they've been working for us for, for a few months now. Okay. And I believe last year at this time in the budget, you had talked about sort of the overload of existing inspectors last year. Um, how, recognizing that with the coronavirus, some of that may be shifted. Um, how is how is the load going now with the inspectors you have? The speaking of the building and trade inspectors, you know, like the electrical and, and plumbing, uh, mechanical inspections, um, we are probably um, three to four weeks backlog right now in inspections, and we project that if. Our, our model right now is, uh, um, our straw man model right now is that we'll go back to normalcy sometime July 1st. Probably by that time, we would be uh, about six to eight weeks backlog in terms of inspections. Is that because, is that because of the, the COVID-19 situation? I'm sorry, um, I, I got cut off. Uh, could you repeat? The question, please. Sure. Is that because of COVID-19? Yes. Right now, generally speaking, generally speaking, we're, work, we're working with uh, an A-shift, B-shift um, operating strategy where you got one, one week on and one week off. So inspections are down to about 50% capacity right now. Overall, the entire department, um, we are ranging between... 60 to 65 percent of our normal capacity, meaning 60 to 65 are either working here, here at the Heritage Building, in the field, or remotely. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. To piggyback on my colleague's question, um, I know you said that we filled all of the positions from last year's budget that were added. Are there any vacancies in the department currently? Yes, we do have vacancies. Um, we have a total of 15 vacancies at the moment. Would it be possible to get a list of those vacancies and for how long they have been vacant? Yes. Um, we, we, we can provide that to the auditor. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Africa, this is uh, Councilwoman uh, Pickard. In the CE's budget remarks, uh, there was reference to an updated fee structure that will be implemented this year in INP. Could you please provide some more information about this? Sure. Um, let, let me start with um the permit review process uh, for development 
So once uh, development projects are approved by the plan planning and zoning, it comes to us with construction plans and, and uh, permit applications to actually build the project. So we review them. These plan reviews also include uh, the other land use develop uh, land use departments, planning and zoning, office of transportation, public works. If you got well and septic, it involves health department. The fire the fire marshal has their inputs on fire suppression systems. So a number of, of uh, agent allied agencies review um, development construction permit um, applications. So that's the backdrop. If if we are are just going to compare the expenditures of inspections and permits, just inspections and permits alone, uh, compared to the revenue that we take in from the permitting process, we have a, a net deficit of about four million every year. In other words. The four million is being four million dollars a year is being subsidized by the general taxpayer. So, one of my uh, strategies is to see how we can correct this uh, situation. So, this has been going on for at least ten years. Um, that's the analysis that we did was for the last ten years. We, we we could also do an analysis even earlier than that, um, but that's what it shows right now. So the strategy basically, the strategy I have basically is to number one, mitigate the recurring budget deficit of uh, $4 million. Um, the the second, second point is we have to reflect the, the cost of money since the last time these fees were, were revised. And the last, our research shows that the last time these fees were re revised was around 2003, and it's 2020 right now, and we haven't revised any of our, our fees since then. The third point I'd like to make is that we, well, basically I said it earlier, shift shift the burden of the operating cost from the general taxpayer to the development activities where it's appropriately a uh, fee for service basically. And in addition, it's an opportunity to do, to reduce the burden on the reforestation fund to move the salaries portion of the forestry staff to the general fund and supported by permit fees because they review vegetative management plants, they go out and review the grading, the reforestation plants and everything, so that the reforestation fund can actually go to the, to the actual planting of trees and not salaries of, of the forestry, um, forestry staff. And lastly, as I mentioned in our key objectives for, for next year, is that we will, we will implement the land use navigator a permitting system and that doesn't come for free. There are operating and maintenance costs for the land use navigator system. So that should be um, included in the updated fees. And we're not changing the fee structure. The formulas stay the same. It's just adjusting it so that we can re recoup um, the appropriate amount of revenue that should be paid by the development um, activities and, and not the general taxpayer. So did, did I are, are those are, are those new is that new fee structure already in place? Is it no. reflected in this budget? No, uh, no. Uh, well, the fee structure and formulas are already in place. Okay, so we're 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 just going to adjust it. For 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 example, um, and these these are not exact numbers. Let's say a permit costs a uh, hundred dollars, uh, a starting permit application. So that would go up to let's say one hundred twenty, one hundred forty dollars, depending on the type the type of uh, a permit that uh, type of building that you're applying for. And take note that as I said. These fees haven't been touched since uh, around 2003. 
So we're just carrying it to, to present time. Okay, thank you. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Piggybacking off of this conversation a little bit, and maybe I just misunderstand, but if I look at page 196 in the budget book, the inspection services that are estimated for fair 2021 look to be about even with 2020, but the inspection services budget line item that you're projecting is two and a half million dollars lower. I, I don't understand how we reconcile those two things. Oh, okay. Well, most of most of the, uh, the well, the two point five million dollar reduction is mostly on reforestation activities and reforestation projects, and that's that's not the general fund. That's reforestation fund. So, as Ms. Flynn uh, explained earlier, the expected revenues coming into the reforestation fund. It's not enough to, to, to maintain the level of activity that we have in reforestation activity. So we have to cut back. If you, you, if you would look at page 23, I'm sorry, what page number was that? 23, 23. If um, you look at page 23, under special revenue funds, there's a lot called reforestation fund. Can I continue? Okay. Page 23, reforestation fund. As you can see, under the column uh, projected fund balance out, out of at 630.20. The fund balance of the reforestation fund is 1.155 million. And our expected revenues for 2021 is 620. So our expected expenditure is $810,000. And if you compare that with the 2020 estimate of 3.4, we have to cut down our expenses so we can maintain a fund balance of about a million dollars and by the end of June, June 30th, 2021. So the, the minimum ceiling uh, I'd like to be is about $20 million for that reforestation fund. So I can only spend $810,000 on reforestation in 2021. And to do that, I have to cut back from FY20 expenditures of uh, 3.4 million. So it's not general fund, it's a uh, reforestation fund that where most of the, uh, the cutting is coming from, the reduction is coming from. Okay, so I was talking about a couple lines below that, the inspection services line oh, well, item that yeah. showed 12 million, not Yes. So that's the line I'm referring to. I'm trying to figure out why that's showing that, is that related to the reforestation fund? Because I was looking at that compared with the inspection services yes. on page 196. Are, are you, please turn to 198, page 198. Madam Chair, pardon me interruption. I just want to remind everyone, particularly when we're skipping around from um, people talking to state your name. So the people that are just calling and listening in know who's speaking. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, Greg Africa here. Please turn to page 198. Ms. Hare. You are correct that the budget for FY 2021 shows 12.79 million. If you look at the upper portion of the table total by fund, that's a 12.79 million. But if you go one line up, reforestation fund, you can see where the reductions are. 
2.9 million in reforestation fund. So it's a reduction of projects that go on the ground, uh, not a reduction in people or, or activity. Um, it's, it's a number of projects. Jessica Hare, District 7. Got it. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Mr. Africa, um, I just, I am curious about the reforestation fund in light of the fact that we did um, the major Forest Conservation Act a few months ago and how that's impacting revenues because um, since the fees and, and whatnot for certain things went up, um, but, but also the incentive for folks to not necessarily pay into the fund. Is that part of why it is that you're not seeing as much in terms of revenue coming into this fund? Um, Madam it, Chair, again, I apologize for interrupting. Uh, Mr. Volke, your audio is pretty faint. I think we heard you, but it's very faint. How's that? Much better. I'll hold it up close. Uh, Greg Africa, responding to uh, Councilman Volke. Um, the tense should not be present tense, but future tense. We are projecting that we are not going to um, collect as much revenue. So you are correct, but it's, it's in the future, not right now. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Mr. Africa with inspections and permits? I don't see any more questions, sir. Was that the, the entirety of your presentation or was there more? Uh, this is Greg Africa. I, that, that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you very much, sir, for your time this, this afternoon. And we will move along with our next presentation. So thank you for being with us today. Um, We'll be pulling in uh, folks from planning and zoning next. Mr. Stephen Kaisiegler, Jean Tinsley, Cindy Carrier, Lori Rhodes, and Ms. Darling Flynn remains with us as their budget analyst. So we'll wait a moment to get everyone situated and we'll continue. Good afternoon, Mr. Kai Ziegler. Uh, we are still pulling forward some staff. Or are you leading the presentation? Good afternoon. Uh, yes, I will be leading the presentation. Um, I'm Steve Kai Ziegler. I'm the Planning and Zoning Officer for the Anne Arundel County uh, Office of Planning and Zoning. And I think has been mentioned, we do have, uh, if needed, uh, Gene Tinsley, who's our budget manager, our expert on all things budget within OPZ. And I've also included uh, Lori Rhodes, Assistant Director for Zoning, and Cindy Carrier, our Planning Administrator for Long Range, in case there's any questions that uh, I might not be able to handle. So um, for Office of Planning and Zoning, we're responsible for planning, managing the physical growth of the county. Some of the key work areas include uh, a review and update of the 10-year general development plan. Um, I'm hoping that all the council members received um, as a CC a status update of where we're at with the GDP. And I understand that uh, one of my deputies, Christina Pompa, has been reaching out to all of the council members for a more in-depth discussion. What I would um, also say is that you can be expecting regular status updates on the GDP process every two to four weeks until the project's completion. Other things. Things that uh, from a plan to parole and Odenton, functional master plans such as the master water sewer plan, um, the greenways plan, and what used to be called small area plan plans, which we're now labeling as region plans, and we have nine of them that we will be undertaking um, in phases. Uh, Office of Planning and Zoning office also administers zoning, subdivisions, and environmental regulations. You will see us involved in the review of site plans, subdivisions, development modifications, and I should stress that 
uh, applications for modifications take a significant um, percentage of our management's time. Uh, Forest Conservation Act review, uh, variants or their appeals through the hearing examiner or the Board of Appeals, and building and grading permits, um, uh, consulting with and assisting inspections and permits. We also handle all development in the critical areas and we provide cultural resource services for the county. Some of the key objectives we have for FY 2021 is to complete plan 2040 for adoption. We need to establish an implementation advisory group for that new GDP. We are um, currently staffed to begin um, um, uh, initiating three region plans. The physical areas of those have not been set yet. That will occur as we uh, converse and discuss and meet with the council throughout the rest. We intend to complete an update of the parole town center plan and complete a targeted redevelopment study for Glen Burnie and provide leadership facility progress of Glen Burnie Revitalization Task Force. Um, I think the um, one of the most important things is um, with COVID-19, we are transitioning into this new way of working with the vast majority of our workforce teleworking. And I would say that we have been and will continue to be fully operational. Um, the Office of Planning and Zoning consists of 71 allocated positions. We currently have nine vacancies. Um, I understand there is support from the administration to fill five uh, planning vacancies within the development division, which will help um, with our review um, and assessment of development applications moving forward. So that is a brief update. I should also point out um, we, we did receive um, uh, support for one new position within the department. That is for a, uh, a planning administrator within GIS. It's actually not a new position, but um, the position has been transferred to the um, Office of Transportation, and we're in need of a, a management level person to take back that role. That's a very brief um, overview of what we do in planning and zoning. Thank you. Were you intending to go through the budget? Oh, Ms. Flynn, are you going to kick us off with that? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. Um, and if you'll turn to page 186, that is the comparative statement of expenditures for the Office of Planning and Zoning. And I'll briefly go over that. Um, there are two funds supporting the uh, office, the general fund and a grant fund. The general fund is proposed at 8.4 million, and that's an increase of 318,100 over FY20. And then the grant fund is uh, proposed at 440,900, which is an increase of 381,100. If you go further down the chart to the object uh, level, personal, personal services has increased uh, $29,200 over the FY20 amount. And that is due to increases in the pay and benefits package offset by, of course, the hiring freeze. There's also an increase in contractual services of 591,300. And those are increases for um, funding for studies. We have some small uh, decreases in supplies and materials. And then under grants, contribution and another there's an increase of $102,000, and that really is a, a majority of that is from a transfer of $75,000 from contractual services to that category. And that's it. Do you have any questions? Thank you. I see Mr. Volke has a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so it looks like the vast majority of the growth in the budget for Office of Planning and Zoning this year is attributable to that contractual services line, the 591,000. You mentioned those were studies. What studies are those? Mr. Ziegler, did you want to talk about the... I'm, I'm actually, if, if I can, I would like uh, Ms. Tinsley to respond to that. Okay. We'll wait for her to come forward in the meeting.
Good afternoon, Ms. Tinsley, you're here and we can hear you. You have the floor, ma'am. Good afternoon, this is Jean Tinsley with the Office of Planning and Zoning. The majority of the growth is the um, 300,000 for a fiscal impact study or a fiscal analysis. Um, Mr. Ziegler is working on finding out an answer about the impact fee study, um, whether or not that can be paid with other funds. Okay, so brief follow up to that, I guess. Oh, Mr. Kaiser, if you want to jump in, maybe you can yes. answer it before the I majority ask. of the 300,000 uh, will be used if it's needed to be used um, to update our impact fee ordinance, which dates back to 2009. Um, right now, I'm working with the Office of Law to determine whether or not we can use existing impact fee money to pay for that updated study. And if we can't, we have a fallback position with this, um, this um, requested funding. At this point, we're not intending to move forward with the fiscal impact analysis. So this is all for impact fee study money. Okay, so the 300,000 or the 591,000 is the impact fee study money. 300,000 is for impact fees. Okay, and then I guess so then the follow-up question would be, what's the balance of the 291,000 for? What other studies? And I'm gonna to defer to Jean again. Um, in FY20, I'm sorry, Jean Tinsley, Planning and Zoning. In FY20, um, there was funding in the amount of $80,000 for a Glen Burnie revitalization consultant. That project um, did not get off the ground. So the county executive has carried that money over to FY21. And then we also have um, funding of about 30,000 for costs of projects, studies, additional things for the GDP that are unanticipated to something that comes up. Okay, and so that puts us at about 410, I'm getting the figure. So then where's the rest of it going? Um, Jean Tinsley Planning and Zoning. Um, we have funding for um, cultural resource consultants in our cultural resources section. That's about 74, I believe. We can also ask for a more detailed description through Madam Auditor, if that would be helpful. Um, Mr. Volke. Yeah, I mean, if, if you all don't know now, then if you can just get back to us, I'd appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Fiedler has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. Um, Mr. Kaiziegler, you said we have nine vacancies and the administration has agreed to fill five of those. Which, which are the nine vacancies and which five are going to be filled? Steve Kaiziegler again. Um, the nine would include uh, a deputy planning and zoning officer, um, a secretary two, uh, a GIS research planning technician. Within the development group, there is a planning technician. One planner one, one planner and the five that the administration indicates support for moving forward uh, would be the five uh, planners indicated under development review. Okay, and I had requested just on an initial look of um, department budgets for um, planning and zoning specifically, a list of vacant positions, um, and folks who have left the department. So it looks like from, I have March and May, March and May of 19 and 20 respectively that I'm looking at, um, and I'm happy to share this. It looks like we've consistently had at least nine vacancies open in the past year. Um, and that since in this current fiscal budget one, we've um, let go of four. Is that accurate? 
I'm not sure if I understand your question. Let me let me perhaps answer it this way. When when I arrived in late July of 2019, we had 14 vacancies. About half were existing and half were attributed to the positions, the new positions the council had agreed to give us. Um, throughout the last nine months, we have filled some of the new vacant positions, some of the the old big positions, which also creates a backfilling uh, issue that we need to now fill. Um, if when you're asking the question of the nine, how many did we let go? Do you mean in terms of terminating? Yeah, it just, I, I'm trying to get an, an idea of how, how we are going to finally eliminate um, funding of vacancies year to year. That was the first question. And um, I'm trying to also understand when we're trying to um, get enough staff for the GDP that we also have folks going out. Um, you've answered part of my question. And I'm sorry, Amanda Feeler, District 5. Um, I, I was wondering how many of the positions added last year have been filled and how many of the previously vacant have been filled. But my question is just why do we continually have at least, it seems in the time that I've been here, nine vacant positions? Wonderful question. Um, and I wish that we could do this faster than we can do this. Um, there's a variety of reasons. Again, part of the reason the number stays high is because our best candidate sometimes is someone within the organization. And so when we hire that person, it essentially becomes a competitive promotion, which then creates another vacancy. Um, but I would also say that um, our recruitment process in Anne Arundel County is different than what I've experienced in other places. And for lack of a, a better way to describe this, it is not necessarily nimble. Um, much of our personnel or human resource processes and procedures are included in either the charter or the code, so it is it is very, very bureaucratic. Um, there's a variety of other issues that I think we're working on with the administration to try and speed up the recruitment process. We're having issues with um, um, being able to offer salaries that are competitive. Uh, in order to offer a more competitive salary, we have to go through a fairly lengthy approval process amongst uh, several sign-offs, which take more time, which then has the potential to frustrate uh, the person that we're trying to bring into the organization and they become more available to others. So there's a variety of factors that are um, affecting the speed that we're able to hire folks. But I, I can also tell you as you know, the, the, the director of this agency, I don't like having nine or 14, anywhere near the numbers of vacant positions we have. We spend an enormous amount of time in the recruitment process. And I think there's many things that in the future we could do different if we decide to do that. Amanda Feeler, District 5, thank you for that answer. I have heard that our process is a little uh, lengthier compared to others. Would it be possible just uh, because I only have the past calendar um, and fiscal year to look at, could I see a snapshot of the last five years and what our vacancies have been? Uh, Steve Kai Ziegler, yes, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Kai Ziegler regarding his operating budget? Mr. Volke. I think this will be quick. Thank you, Nathan Volke, District 3. So I guess my question would be this, assuming that you fill all your vacancies and we didn't give you new positions, if you're up to full staff, can you do the work that you need to do? Steve Kai Ziegler, um, I think what we can do is we can promise to complete the GDP. We can start three region plans. We would be able to do development review faster than we can do it now. Um, we could, what I'm getting at is we could um, um, complete the mission or work program that's currently assigned to us much, much better than we can now. It would be a big help. Thank you, Allison Pickard Chair. 
I, I don't see any more questions from my colleagues regarding the planning and zoning operating budget. Um, was that was that the bulk of was that the entirety of your presentation, sir? I think that completes my presentation. Again, Steve Kai Ziegler. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for being with us this afternoon. We'll move ahead to our next um, agency. Y'all have a good day. Next, we will be hearing from the Department of Transportation with Mr. Ramond Robinson and Crystal McGill Beck. Darlene Flynn is also their budget analyst, so she will be staying with us. We'll wait a moment while those folks get pulled in. Mr. Robinson, can we hear you? Hi, can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay. It's hard to see. I'm trying to make myself more visible, but it's just, I gave up. Uh, well, we can hear you. We, we've seen it all so far. It's only been a week and we've seen all kinds of presentations. So we can hear you, sir. You have the floor. Madam so, Chair, yes. we will ask if Mr. Robinson could speak extremely loudly and clearly. It is a little difficult to hear. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ramon Robinson with the Office of Transportation. Um, I have with me uh, Crystal McGill Belk, who is an administrator in the Office of Transportation, who will be able to answer any of the questions that I cannot. Uh, just to kind of give you a brief overview about the Office of Transportation, our primary purpose for Anne Arundel County is to establish multimodal transportation systems and connections. It is for us to improve transportation safety. And we do that by, from a transit perspective, we're trying to increase geographic coverage. From a highways perspective, we're trying to make sure that we have increased capacity for accessibility to growth areas. From a pedestrian and bicycle connection standpoint, we're expanding our transportation, our sidewalk network, as well as our trail systems to communities and areas within the county. Um, our key objectives for this particular budget is to Encourage and promote innovative solutions as it relates to transportation to maximize the use and the efficiency of the existing transportation systems on a neighborhood, county, and regional basis um, to improve our transportation system along major corridors between major origin and destination locations um, to provide feedback to uh, the county's development as it relates to a transportation perspective, looking at safe reliable, viable ways to provide multimodal transportation. And that includes being a part of the development review process, looking at the near-term, mid-term, and long-term facilitation of improved transportation and the transportation program for Anne Arundel County. Um, we, and we have 10 people on staff. Currently, right now, one person is, we have one vacant position. Uh, as it was stated before, we are receiving a position or it's proposed to receive a position that will help us with a lot of our data gathering as it relates to transportation from the Office of Planning and Zoning. With that, I'll pass it over to Darlene. Thank you. Ms. Flynn, you have the floor. You're still muted. There you go. Thank you. Good afternoon, Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. And I'd like to turn your attention to page 171 of the budget book. And that is the page that gives the comparative statement of expenditures for the Office of Transportation. The Office of Transportation is funded by the general fund and a grant fund to support their activities. The general fund is proposed to be $6.1 million in FY21, which is 61,700 over last year, or current year, pardon me, FY20. And then the grant fund is proposed to be 2.8 million, which is about $900,000 decrease from FY20. If you look further down the page to the object level breakout, uh, the personal services uh, area of their budget is increasing by 160,000. Some of that is a result of the increase in pay packages and benefits. Uh, but they've also got a new position that's transferred to their department. Under contractual services, there's a reduction of 586,200. 
Um, and again, that's bringing their costs in line with the grant and also with historical expenditures. And then there are some small uh, changes within supplies, materials, business. Uh, the other major uh, change is really under grants, contribution, and other, and that's a reduction of 453,000 um, in that category. That wraps that up. Thank you. Do we have any questions uh, for the Department of Transportation? Ms. Lacey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the decrease in the grants, contributions, and other, the explanation or the commentary on page 172 says uh, this funding um, offsets the costs associated with public transportation in the county. The decrease is attributable to changes in federal and state funding match and contributions. Can you describe more what these changes are and are they expected to be permanent changes um, in these types of contributions? So this is Ramon Robinson, Office of Transportation. Uh, I'll take a stab. Um, so what we do know is that we are receiving less grant contributions, particularly from the, from the federal government and from the state. Um, this shows a actual grant reduction based on a grant that we had that was with the state that was for a pilot over a, I think, a two-year time period. And so that grant is no longer. So that, that is where we do see a difference in the grants that are being provided. The question as to whether this is going to be like this forever, if you were to ask me this a couple of months ago, I probably would have said, no, I think things will probably go through some changes. But now, just kind of given the environments, it's really hard to say uh, what the new normal is going to look like. And so to follow up on that, uh, Sarah Lacey, District 1, what then is of the funding that is remaining in the fiscal year 21 budget, um, 402,000, um, what's that going toward? So Ramon Robinson, Office of Transportation. So we still do have grant funds that we're receiving that we have to provide matching funds for. So that's what that amount goes for. So even though we don't have the full extent of all the grants that we've had in previous years, we still do have grants that we have to have match dollars for, and that's what that accounts for. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for the Department of Transportation at this time? I do not see any more questions. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Madam Chair. Does that conclude the entirety of your presentation for the council today? Uh, Ramon Robinson, Officer of Transportation, it does. Yes, okay, good. Well, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and have a great day, stay well. Thank you. So, we will move along as we move through our next um, we're going to be hearing from the Department of Public Works in three sections. So I will will pull forward Mr. Chris Phipps and I'll let him introduce who's with him today. Hi, this is Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works. Um, can everyone hear me? We can. All right. So that's going to be a hard act to follow. Um, so I would like to uh, thank you for allowing us to present our budget, uh, the FY21 budget today, and assisting me uh, or available if needed are Karen Henry, the Assistant Director, David Braun, the Acting uh, Chief of Engineer for uh, Engineering, Alex Bacchier, uh, Deputy Director for Highways, Noel Aniskevich, Deputy Director for Utilities, and Rody Holdhouse, the Deputy Director for Solid Waste. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to just hit some highlights. I will throw it over to Darlene to uh, go over our comprehensive uh, budget summary, and then we'll go um, flip through uh, the couple pages of our uh, bureaus and hit the highlights. 
So I, I do want to just mention that, you know, we've developed this budget uh, in full recognition of the, the COVID-19 budget reality uh, and um, we're adjusting accordingly, um, but I think we'll be fine. And uh, I think we will be uh, able to get through this budget and meet our objectives um, as, as we need to. Um, we, we will, I, I, if you go to page 205, I just wanna hit some of the highlights for this past year and our upcoming uh, objectives for FY21. We did initiate a food, pilot food scrap uh, program, drop off program at the Central Recycling Center in Millersville. And we hope to, we will be uh, advancing and uh, expanding that to include the Dover Road and the Southern uh, uh, Recycling Center as well. Um, and we've also, one of the sort of quiet heroics we've achieved over the year was we reduced our uh, contamination rate in our recycling uh, containers, our single stream. And that um, saved us quite a bit in terms of salvaging the contract we have with our uh, recycling uh, sorting facility. We were able to reduce our contamination rate from 26 down to 14%, which allowed us to stay compliant within our contract terms. The, we've also completed resurfacing 140 uh, lane miles. We've completed over 600 uh, ADA curb ramps. We've leveraged over 200 or $2.5 million worth of private funds in advancing some of our stormwater projects through the full performance uh, contract uh, delivery uh, approach. We also capitalize, capitalizing on the excellent plant for performance at our wastewater plants. We were able to successfully uh, complete the state's first trading program, nutrient trading between uh, water reclamation facilities and uh, stormwater permits, the MS4 permit. So we're proud of that. And it, as well, we had enough left over. We successfully competed with uh, the, uh, for the Maryland Department of Environment Clean Water Commerce Act, and we secured over $8 million that will be um, available over four, the next four years um, due to the performance credits that we've, we've uh, been able to realize and will realize. Uh, we, we expect in the next coming year to complete solar, solar array projects at the um, closed Glen Burnie landfill, as well as the uh, utility operations complex in Millersville. And we are excited to uh, initiate a, a study and design of an automated water meter reading uh, program to get us uh, into this gen this century as it as it is as it relates to water meter uh, reading and billing uh, services. So I'm going to flip to page 206 and defer to Darlene to go over the uh, comparative statements. Thank you. Good afternoon, Darlene Flynn with the Budget Office. Um, as Chris mentioned, uh, we're on page 206. So if you look at the top of the chart, there are currently seven funds that um, provide support for this department. The general fund is proposed at 31.9 million, which is a decrease of 2.8 million. The um, Piney Orchard, or pardon me, the uh, Water Wastewater Operating Fund which is proposed at 112,997,500, which is a decrease of 5.7 million over FY20. The Water Wastewater Sinking Fund is 69,490,900, which is an increase of 4.2 million from FY20. The Waste Collection Fund is proposed at 62,796,700, which is an increase of 2.6 million over FY20. And lastly, the Watershed Protection and Restoration Fund, which is proposed at 23.1 million, a 2.1 million increase over FY20. Below on the chart, under the object level, you'll see a breakout by types of expense. Under personal services, uh, the budget has increased 912,400. The majority of that is an increase in the pay and benefit package over FY20, with some offset for um, the hiring freeze turnover adjustment. Under contractual services, there's an increase of 1.4 million, uh, and that's mostly in solid waste. The uh, supplies and materials is got a decrease of 647,900, and that's adjustments in mostly the water, wastewater. The business travel are just small adjustments throughout. Capital outlay has a two point, about $2 million increase, and that's a reduction in the 
equipment and uh, mechanical equipment replacement. The debt service, there is an increase of 6.8 million. For the most part, that is in the water, wastewater, and in the watershed protection funds. Under grants, contributions, and others, there's a decrease, pardon me, of $7.1 million. And for the most part, that's a reduction in pay go. And there's some other adjustments in there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phipps, you have the floor. Thank you, Chris Phipps again. Um, if you could flip to page 207, it just give you a, an overall position summary for the department. And you'll see that we are, um, we're adding one position overall but what's important to note, I'd like to highlight is that the general fund is, is actually um, we're reducing it by one position and we're essentially moving two positions over to from the general fund into the watershed protection fund. These are what we call vector rotter positions. Um, they do the stormwater inlet cleaning um, and they were in the general fund. We're now just recognizing them in where they appropriately do their work, which is uh, supporting the stormwater program by doing storm drain inlet cleaning. So if, if page uh, 208, um, and I'll go in the next three pages are general fund uh, pro, uh, elements of, of our budget, the director's office, which is uh, showing a $9,700 increase, mostly due to the uh, package pay, personnel package and benefits. Page 209 is the Bureau of Engineering we're showing a $441,000 increase. Um, most of that is uh, two elements. Uh, one is we're in the third installment of a uh, update to our design manual, uh, standards specifications and design manual. And so we're requesting additional funding for that to complete it. Um, the other is for uh, replacing aged survey equipment. We have uh, three uh, survey grade receivers that are millimeter accuracy and they're in need of replacement. The next page on 210, Bureau of Highways, you'll see where uh, the, the budget proposal is to reduce it by 2.9 million. And the bulk of this is associated with our heavy equipment replacement schedule. Uh, we are not going to be, uh, we had to reduce that. This is obviously, uh, one of the things that we had to sacrifice and compromise as it relates to COVID-19 realities. And we also, on, on the positive side, we, we had a $700,000 um, decrease associated with in contractual services for uh, LED streetlights. So we're paying less towards our BGE bill for our streetlight program to the tune of $700,000. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> the Next project, um, the next uh, series of uh, pages, I'm uh, moving into the enterprise funds outside of the general fund. And the first is the water wastewater utility operations. We're requesting uh, overall decrease of six point, nearly $6.5 million. And so it's associated in, in several different places, uh, most significant of which is in the uh, PAYGO. So we're not gonna be um, contributing as much PAYGO dollars towards the capital program. However, that what we're not um, contributing through PAYGO has been more than offset in our capital program funding with bond premium funds. So um, I'm satisfied with that. It keeps us solvent, keeps our um, capital program uh, less debt incurred on the capital program by doing that. Um, the, we're also, I think it was, and Darlene had mentioned earlier, We've got a reduction um, in some of our chemicals. Um, and this is really because as our ENR plants or enhanced nutrient removal technology has, um, has matured, we've, we're dialing in the operational elements and we feel that we can uh, reduce this amount and meet all our permit obligations. And the other is a capital outlay uh, increase associated with um, a load bank generator, which is just something that we can we can exercise our generators even on no flow conditions at our wastewater uh, pumping stations. This allows us to exercise those um, in, in in accordance with our schedule for exercising. 
the going to page 212, uh, Water and Wastewater Finance Administration, this is really uh, where we fund much of the pro rata share. And that's really what this uh, slight increase is, 410,000 uh, associated with grants and contributions is related to our pro the, the utility funds pro rata share contribution to the general fund. The next page, 213, is the debt service fund for utilities. And given the, uh, with, with the capital project expenditures and the, the uh, servicing the debt, we have an increase need of $4.2 million. Next page, 214. Uh, this is really just cleaning up. This is the other DPW funds. D developer street lights is now in the capital program. So there's no need for funding there. The Piney Orchard Wastewater uh, Plant, now that the county owns it and is running it, we're, we don't have to budget for uh, diverting. What we were doing is um, redirecting 80% of the revenues collected from the customers to the private entity that was running and owning, that owned the plant. We now retain all those uh, revenues from the ratepayers. So that will be eliminated as well. And page 215 is waste management services. And you'll see we're requesting the $2.6 million increase. Much of this, most of it is associated with our contract curbside collection contracts, where we have automatic CPI adjustments that uh, take uh, place that we need to be able to fund. Uh, we also have uh, within contractual services, we pay the Annapolis uh, Junction Transfer Station uh, for sending our uh, much of our curbside collection trash goes there and we have an increased need uh, because we're going to be diverting more trash to the to the transfer station less to the landfill now that our cell 9.1 has come up out of the ground we don't need to use uh, soft trash anymore so that soft trash is going to be uh, redirected back to Annapolis Junction that is consistent with our overall strategy to extend the life of the landfill And finally, um, the watershed uh, fund, watershed program, we are requesting an additional 1.985 million for it, most of which is associated with the debt service uh, as the capital program continues to uh, get expended um, and we complete our, uh, our um, schedule of projects. So that's what 1.6 million of that 1.9 million. And um, what I would like to, I believe that you all should have a um, handout, a separate handout, a supplemental handout that I'd like to quickly walk through to present some of the change, a, a major change in the department as it relates to the watershed program. And in that uh, handout, if you go to the first page in after the cover page, just a brief um, explanation and overview of what the watershed protection and restoration program does. Essentially, it's, it is what we need. It, its main focus is to meet the obligations of our stormwater permit, what's called the MS4 permit through MDE, as well as our watershed implementation plan, which is uh, essentially the Bay Diet, that the imposition of the Bay Diet obligations that come from EPA to MDE, and then MDE just to, uh, allocates that obligation to the counties. And this is our... Um, one of our uh, responsibilities. As next page, I show a um, a mirrored or a by a look at the organizational structure that we're proposing. The current um, department is organized in four, four bureaus: engineering, highways, utilities, and waste management. Just as I've gone through those um, those previous slides, the engineering bureau is a support bureau. The other three bureaus, highways, utilities, and, and waste management are operating bureaus. They maintain assets, they meet permit conditions, all the functions are necessary to operate a, a, an entity to accomplish certain achievables. They, with what we're proposing, we're asking to create a fifth bureau, the Bureau of uh, Watershed Protection, as it has now, as it has matured, really evolved into more of an operating bureau. Currently, it's embedded, as you see on the left side, in the Bureau of Engineering. 
what now represents over 60% of the engineering budget. So it's really out, outlived and outsized that program and has, be, has really evolved from a, a support program into an operational um, program. The other thing we're doing is um, we're taking the storm drain and stormwater uh, component from highways and also collapsing that into the new bureau. So instead of having different stormwater activities going on in different bureaus, they're all going to be uh, consolidated under one, one uh, bureau. So the next two slides really just show that in more detail. Current, where we've got the watershed protection and engineering, and we've got infrastructure management, stormwater, and highways, how that collapses into the proposed organization, which is shown on uh, the next page. And then finally, I have a uh, page that shows the the overall how the organization would be structured and essentially we're not there there are no new requests um, from positions only the two that transferred from general fund we are doing a reclassification of an existing vacancy to create a new deputy director position and then just to uh, kind of summarize why are we doing this why uh, a new bureau within the, the, the department um, you know, this was originally established in FY14, and it was embedded in the Bureau of Engineering for no uh, other reason. We had to start something, we had to get it going, and we built it out of whole cloth, if you will. And at that time, there was a small element of watershed uh, activity going on in the Bureau of Engineering. Um, it's since evolved, as I've mentioned, from a support to an operational agency. Um, we're also the benefit of consolidating the stormwater activities that go on throughout the, the department into one. Bureau um, that also goes with the funds and expenditures. They can all now be collapsed into one bureau. I mentioned the 61% of the engineering budget. It's outsized that. And then other um, productivity uh, increases that we've seen over the years um, with the CIP expanding. We've done 10 times, we're doing 10 times more impervious area treatment than we did at the start. We've expanded our grant and education program, um, and the list goes on. The, the other thing is that it allows us to be more nimble and uh, providing more autonomy for that group to get their work done, providing a more horizontal uh, organizational structure, less vertical. And finally, it, it elevates the visibility and accountability of the, of the uh, activity in the program. I think that we've we've done a lot in education and, and trying to do outreach, um, but at the same time, it's sometimes difficult to get through the layers of the department, the Bureau of Engineering, to find the watershed program. So this, we believe, will um, increase its uh, visibility and accountability overall as well. So that really concludes my formal presentation, and um, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Phipps. This is Allison, uh, Chair. I see a, a question from Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Mr. Phipps, so I uh, I understand the rationale that you've advanced for creating the new bureau it makes a lot of sense. I guess one of the things that I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly, because it seems to me like this could be one of the key reasons for it is, does creating this new entity and then, you know, potentially having that tied to the watershed protection fund now give you a new source of revenue for that bureau that allows you to expand it a little more easily than if you were having to come back into the general fund? Chris Phipps, um, not not really, because the, the fund is already dispersed in, in several places in the in throughout the county. We also have it um, funding some of Greg Africa's um, inspectors because he has the inspection authority and code. So we, we do fund positions over there. The rest of the funding here is already in the department. It's in highways or it's in the watershed the Bureau of Engineering. So we're not adding any new funding um, con uh, connectivity or expanding that. It all still, what, what we're showing here currently resides in the Department of Public Works from a funding standpoint. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions for Mr. Phipps today? 
the sun is shining today, Mr. Phipps. So you're getting um, you're getting off early, maybe. <laughs> you're you're I don't welcome. see any I don't see any further questions from my colleagues. So with that, um, thank you this afternoon for your time and your personal. Oh, Miss Oh, Miss Lacey, you're waving, right? Oh. We're saying goodbye. Okay, good. Okay, thank you so much. Um, All right, so with that, is there any other business to be brought before the County Council at this time? Seeing none, may I have a motion to adjourn? So may move, have, Council Bruski. May I have a second? Second, Bulky. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, none opposed. The motion carries. The County Council is adjourned until 1 p.m. on Monday, May 12th. No. The County Council is adjourned 11. until um, 7 p.m. on 7 PM, Monday night. Monday the 11th, correct, Monday. for our regular legislative session. Yes. Please continue to check the county website for important information and updates. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.